Hello, Soundies. Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Today is the 7th of May, 2023. It's great to have you all here with us and hope you're all doing well out there. We have a different setup today. So uh, one of the notes in the chat here from Christopher was, I don't, I've always wondered why you don't use your SQ5 in auto mix. Well, <laughs> here's an explanation. We are in the open basement. This area is, um, there's more space here. And frankly, the SQ5 doesn't fit well when I'm streaming from the office over here. So that's the main reason I don't typically use the Allen and Heath in that room. So we moved out here today. We're, um, we're trying to stay warm. It's 50 degrees Fahrenheit in this room. <laughs> and despite the fact that uh, I love LED lights, they're wonderful and they're getting better and better by the day. Um, they don't produce as much heat as tungsten lights, and so it's still quite chilly in here. But nevertheless, um, we're going to jump in and talk about auto mix, which is something I've wanted to talk about for quite some time. So first of all, um, we, we didn't have any questions submitted ahead of time that I saw, so we'll go ahead and cover auto mixing, do a demo, and then we'll come out to the chat and uh, have, a, have a talk there and answer any questions that anyone might have there. Now... If you're recording a podcast or a live stream, or, or and I guess a live stream is live to tape, so to speak, live to tape, um, or you're doing any sort of live show where you have multiple people talking and therefore you have multiple microphones open or on at the same time, it can be a little tricky. And let's do a quick demonstration of that. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to turn off our auto mixer and I'm going to enable our microphones here. So, Danny, you're live now. Do you want to say a little something there? Hi, everyone. This is Danny, live from the basement. <laughs> so Danny's over here, probably two and a half meters away, would you say? Yeah, roughly. Okay, now why don't you come over here? We have another microphone over here. Danny's going to talk into that. So while as I'm talking, you, you probably heard her just set her headphones down there. And now she's going to pick up this microphone. And let's say I was oriented like this. Danny's just right here, about a meter from me. So you go ahead and talk. Hi, this is Danny. I'm not sure what to say today. Uh, we have some rain moving in, I think. Yeah, it's been a little windy, a little unsettled lately. Yep. Last weekend, it was really hot. Okay. It was warm and sunny. This weekend, it's cool and rainy. Yeah, okay. We're getting our April weather. We're getting, we're getting our April weather in May. In May. It's a little late. We'll take it, though. Take the moisture, I think. Of course. Yep. Okay. All right. If you want to go ahead and put that one back down, head back over to your spot. I'm going to pull her fader back while we set the mic down. You... If you're listening carefully there, you can probably hear a little bit of uh, mic bleed. So when Danny talked, she was also being picked up by my microphone. Let me just reorient this a little bit here. And when I talked, um, it was picking up my voice in my microphone plus in her microphone as well. So there are a lot of things you can do to help prevent that from being an issue. That, that You'll start to get this phasey sound. You'll pick up more noise when multiple microphones are open at the same time. In fact, you're probably hearing some of that now. So this key light right here has a fan in it. Can you hear that, Danny? No, okay, she, she's not hearing it right now. Some of you might be able to hear it. Some of the super hearers out there might hear it. Um, and if we have three microphones open at the same time, there's a good chance you're going to hear some of that. In addition to that, of course, again, when I'm talking, we still have all three microphones open, no auto mix on right now. Um, and we're actually spaced far enough apart that it's probably not a huge issue right now. So that actually is one of the lessons is I'm going to go ahead and, and fade back the two other microphones, Danny's and, and this other handheld mic. Now we're just back on me. Um, there, there are a number of things you can do to prevent that microphone bleed and to prevent that um, phase. And the, and the reason that phase is an issue and why I say that, if I'm talking and I'm this exact distance from my microphone right here, my voice is also projecting beyond that into another microphone that's a farther distance away. And because that microphone is going to pick up my the sound waves that I'm producing a little bit later, 
those sound waves can be in a different phase than what this microphone is capturing. And when you hear those combined after they've been mixed, they can you, they, you'll start to experience comb filtering or constructive and destructive interference. They'll mix together. And if the waveform, say, say this microphone's waveform is currently here and the other one is currently in this part of the waveform, um, they can they can mess with each other. They can either boost things that shouldn't be boosted or or cut things or attenuate things that shouldn't otherwise be attenuated if you're just standing next to the person hearing them talk. So that's kind of a very rough explanation of comb filtering or phasey sounding audio. And once you add more microphones, it gets even worse. And so that's one of the things that we're trying to address with auto mixing. Now, there are a couple of things you can do. You can the farther you space the microphones apart and the people that are speaking into those microphones apart. There's a there's a rule that oftentimes engineers will use, a three to one rule. So the distance between me and my microphone is the one, and every other microphone should be at least three times that distance from this microphone. That can help a lot. Now, that's one thing you can do. Another thing you can do, of course, is if you're using directional microphones, which in this case we are. This is the Vintage 11 from Jay-Z Microphones that we reviewed a few months ago. It has a cardioid polar pattern, so it's most sensitive here on the front, least sensitive on the back, um, and then it falls off somewhat on the sides. Using that polar pattern and how you position the microphone relative to where the other people are in the room can help a whole ton as well. And so that on its own can make a huge, huge difference. So if you're doing a two-person podcast, a lot of times what I like to do is have them sitting on uh, opposite each other at a table. And if possible, um, at least a meter away, preferably a little bit more if possible. That way they can still hear each other very well. Um, or, you know, and they can also hear each other if they're wearing headphones, which they should be generally. Um, but it also uses the microphone's polar pattern to help prevent me talking into their microphone, being picked up by their microphone, because I'll be facing the back of their microphone and they'll be facing the back of mine. So those are some considerations. Now beyond that, uh, one other thing you can do, and a lot of in broadcast situations, they'll use auto mixers. So for example, if you think of a news program, they're wearing lavalier microphones. Most of the time they're using omnidirectional lavalier microphones. And um, so they'll often use auto mixing as an, an additional measure, additional means of making sure that you get a clean mix so that when I'm talking, Danny's microphone isn't wide open, picking up my voice as well. It'll actually pull her voice or her microphone down a little bit, her level down a little bit. So it picks up less of me and vice versa. So that's the idea. Now, a lot of people say, well, why can't you just use a, um, a noise gate? Why not just use a noise gate? And the problem with a noise gate, from my perspective, is that you can, certainly you can, and it can help. The trick with a noise gate is that things start to get kind of fluttery. Um, it will, if I'm talking loud enough or am I laughing, Danny's noise gate might open. And so then my voice is also going to be captured by her microphone at that period as well. So it's really difficult and sometimes impossible to really get the thresholds on a noise gate tuned in so that it works reliably. Now, if you're having just a very measured conversation, it can be perfectly fine. And you're using these other techniques, face, you know, using the polar pattern of the microphone, so the, the null or the back of my microphone where it's least sensitive, facing Danny, who's the other participant in the podcast or whatever, that can help a lot. Um, so let's look at a couple of things here. I want to talk through a, a couple of different implementations. There's a lot of different ways to implement auto mixing. And if we'll go over to the Mac now, and I'm going to show a couple things. So here is Dan Dugan's site. Dan Dugan is a sound engineer, and he makes uh, a variety of automatic mixing controllers, but he developed this algorithm. And um, it's actually one of the most popular. It works really, really well. It's very, uh, very transparent sounding. And let me just read a couple things here. I'm going to make this bigger, actually. Um, that's Dan right there. I've met him. He was at NAB a few years ago, and I got a chance to meet him. Um, he says this, an automatic mixer controls a group of live microphones, turning up mics where someone is talking and turning down mics that aren't being used. This is a real-time voice-activated process completely different from studio automation that only plays back pre-recorded moves. People have tried to do automatic mixing with gates, but experience has shown that in most live situations, it isn't possible to find a gate threshold that will work without obvious chopping. This is because sometimes 
when the room is noisy, the noise level at the microphone is higher than the voice level will be at another time when the room is quiet. An automatic mixer can adapt to changing conditions, whereas a gate can't. Another problem that automatic mixers must solve is the additive effect of multiple mics being open at the same time. If one mic is on at maximum gain, opening up another one will make the system feed back. So automatic mixer must also track the gain of the whole system to prevent feedback or excessive noise pickup. And a final problem that automatic mixers should solve is maintaining a natural ambiance from the room. And what he, what he means by that is if you, uh, if you cut off all of the ambiance sound in the room, it sounds very unnatural. It sounds very obviously processed. And so he's saying that it should, it should account for that. It shouldn't completely cut off the natural room ambiance. A good automatic mixer should be able to make rapid and dramatic changes in the gains of all the input channels while maintaining the sonic illusion that nothing is happening at all. So that's what Dan Dugan has uh, put into his auto mix algorithm. And uh, you can he, he obviously has some hardware that he sells um, and, and in a variety of different formats. So that's usually going to be for live sound is, I think, his primary audience there. Now, there's also a, a version that works in a Waves rack. Uh, right here, Waves Dugan Auto Mixer. There are also some hardware implementations of the same thing. So here, for example, sound devices on their 8 series recorders, the 888, the 833, and then the flagship, the Scorpio. They also implement, uh, incidentally, Dan Dugan's own auto mixing. So here, let's see here. Where do he, he has a mention of it here. Here it is. Enable Dugan auto mixing or mix assist. They have two different flavors of auto mixing on the 8 series. So they've licensed Dan Dugan's algorithm, and they've also created their own called Mix Assist. And it's used, again, does the same general idea, and we'll dig into more details about what it does specifically. But that's available on the 8 series recorders. That comes with them, in fact. And then on the Sound Devices Mix Pre recorders, you can purchase a plugin for $99 US that adds uh, Mix Assist capability to your Mix Pre. So that's another option there. Of course, Zoom on their F6 and their F8N Pro recorders also have their own version of Auto Mix. Again, same general idea. But let me just kind of talk about uh, this. Here's an explanation here that Sound Devices made about Auto Mixing. And they compare the two different ways that uh, Dugan and Mix Assist work. And here, here's what they say. They say Dugan's system operates on a very elegant principle. Each individual input channel is attenuated or pulled down or reduced by an amount in decibels equal to the difference in decibels between the channel's level and the sum of all channel levels. The gain of all channels is adjusted immediately and continuously based on what each channel is receiving. The neat aspect of this mathematical construct is that the total gain throughout the system never changes. So overall, it'll be the same. So when Dan was talking about being able to create this illusion that nothing's being done, this this Dugan auto mixing does a really, really good job at that. It does a good job because it makes it, it doesn't sound like you're doing some intentional mixing. <laughs> it just, the, the overall ambient level sounds good overall. So here's, for example, for anyone uh, not talking, it will actually attenuate them by about 6 dB. And if you have two talkers that are 20 dB above the other mics, um, this is what it does here. So it's attenuating those others by quite a lot, minus 23 dB. But those two that are open, it's only attenuating by 3 dB. So if they're both talking at the same time, it also accounts for those situations when people talk over each other. I think in America, we especially have a, a tendency to talk over each other. <laughs> and then another example here of various people talking at different levels. So that's the idea of Dan Dugan auto mixing. Now there's this other one that was developed by Sound Devices, which is, and, and again, all of them have slightly different approaches here, but Mix Assist approaches things a little bit differently. It uses a series of rules and so it, it makes a variety of decisions. So this was originally actually created by Steve Yolstrom, I think is how you say his name. He worked at Shure for many years, and he worked on some of their early automatic mixers. 
So, and this really formed the basis of the, the sound devices. So it uses these rules. First, a noise adaptive threshold. So for each microphone, an ever-changing and automatic threshold is continuously calculated. This per-channel threshold has a slow attack and very fast decay. This characteristic makes essential, uh, uh, the odd wording there, sorry, essentially makes the NAT or NAT noise adaptive threshold a good hole detector of the audio. The logic being that the room noise is always going to be found at the trough of the audio envelope. When an incoming microphone signal is instantaneously above this threshold, it can be turned on. So that, for, that way, steady state sounds like air conditioning will not turn on a microphone, only varying speech-like signals. So it has a, um, a detector unit that figures out when somebody is talking into a microphone. In addition to that, it applies this max bus idea. And what this does is it's similar to... Uh, let's see here... Actually, we'll come back to that. So Maxbus, the envelope of all microphone signals is logically ORed together to get the instantaneous peak of the loudest microphone. Each mic's envelope is continuously compared to this Maxbus. If the envelope is greater and it meets the NAT criteria, the previous one we talked about, then it's gated on. If a talker speaks into two or more microphones, it will only gate on one of the microphones, eliminating any comb filtering. So you can see how that essentially is listening all the time and comparing this max bus to each individual mic to determine when to turn on a mic. Also, if everyone stops talking, the last used microphone remains on. And that is part of what helps maintain that continuous ambient sound. So you don't uh, cut that off and it doesn't sound that, have that really unnatural sound. Off attenuation, when a microphone is turned off, it does not turn all the way off. Instead, it is attenuated by a certain amount, typically 15 decibels. This results in a more transparent sound, and there is little benefit noise-wise to attenuating a microphone completely off. So that's, that's another thing that it does here. So it never turns it all the way off. It just attenuates it by a substantial amount. 15 dB is quite a bit. There's also this number of open mic attenuators. So for each doubling of the number of open microphones, the gain is attenuated by three decibels. That is so that when multiple people are talking at the same time, it reduces all of their levels so that it doesn't overload the mix. And this is very similar to the Dugan concept, which maintains the total gain throughout the system. So one question I, I in fact, I had this question when I went to the Sound Devices booth the very first year I went to NAB was I said, well, why do you have Dugan Auto Mix and Mix Assist? What's the difference? And um, at the time, I, the, the person at the booth that I spoke with said, oh, well, they're just different algorithms. Both of them have their strengths and weaknesses, and they sound a little bit different. In my own experience, what I found is that if you want something that's very transparent sounding, Dugan is probably the best choice. And if you want something that's a little bit better at managing the overall noise floor, I felt like Mix Assist typically did a better job. It was a little bit more aggressive. Um, it also, in some way, respects, made a, a slightly cleaner sounding mix but it also wasn't perfect. And um, I felt where, where Dugan sounded more transparent, the mix assist sounded cleaner. Um, so it's kind of a, a, a trade-off. The, the, the downside, I guess, of mix assist is sometimes it sounded a little less natural, whereas the Dugan auto mix, well, it sounded a lot more natural. It didn't always catch all, as, as much of the noise and such. So those are some thoughts there. Okay, let's go ahead and let's come back out. Let's take a look at the chat and see what we have going on in the chat today. Danny's going to show us. Oh, by the way, microphones we're using today. So we're, you are hearing the SQ5. Um, that's what we're using today. And I'm going to go ahead and put Danny's mic level up. So if she wants to say anything, she can. I'm not going to touch the fader from this point. Well, I'll tell you if I touch the fader again. But if you want to say anything, you can go ahead and say it. If not, that's fine too. You don't have to say anything. <laughs> So I'm looking through the chat. Cool. I will, I guess, first show the questions that have to do with what you were just talking about. Cool. We have some other questions too, which we'll get back to later. Okay, fantastic. That sounds good. Let's do it. All right. Would you still use the three to one rule if using lav mics? Actually, I would lean more into that rule if I'm using lavalier mics because again they're they're omnidirectional they're somewhat directional from the standpoint that they're attached to a person and that person helps create the at least kind of the the equivalent effect of a directional microphone but yeah absolutely if you're using lav mics the farther away you can get them the better now I realize in narrative film uh, narrative film is different you're not live first of all so 
Um, in post, you can you can attenuate the mics in post, but if you're doing something more live, like a live stream, or you don't want to have to do a lot of work in post, such as for a podcast, that's where using this three to one rule is especially helpful. So I would use as much of that even farther if you can get them away farther, but that will just help make the mix cleaner overall. So absolutely yes. I'm also wondering if Mix Assist would work on my Mix Pre 6.2 in 32-bit float. Um, I believe it does. I don't believe there's any sort of, of limitation there. I think I think the answer is yes. Daniela, do this only work as hardware on specific devices, or are they available as plugins as well? Great question. I'm glad you asked that. There is, um, let me just pull this up, WT Auto Mixer. We covered this quite some time ago. There is a software uh, plugin, a VST AU AAX, so it can be used in pretty much any digital audio workstation called WT Auto Mixer. Looks like they're on version two now. We we originally looked at version one, um, but this is a software version of that. And we created, we did a live stream some time ago. If you just search for Curtis Judd WT Auto Mixer, you should find that. And yes, there is an option out there. Great question, Daniela. Audiobuff says, as we speak, I'm setting up 25 mics for our church orchestra. Compression is the only mix assistance I use. I agree with Curtis on best practices for setup. The less processing I have to use, the better. Let me clarify one thing as well. Oh, um, and then he finally, he says, but it requires way more hands-on mixing on my part. Yes. Um, mix assist uh, of any sort that I've ever heard of is for spoken word audio. Um, sometimes I'll have... Uh, musicians ask, hey, should I use this on music? Not meant for that. Not not The idea with auto mix here is that when the idea is that one person will be talking at a time, generally, and if multiple people are talking at the same time, it's going to pull them all down. Um, but yeah, for certainly with an orchestra, um, I would do that manually. No, no mix assist. Completely agree, audio buff. Diesel says, I have a speech tomorrow for a class. I want to record it with the audio separately. I have a Samson Q2U. I'll be connecting it to my phone via USB with an adapter. I was wondering how I should hold a handheld mic. Well, um, I'll give you some thoughts. Let me just grab one here. <clears throat> and I'm going to go ahead and switch to this one. Okay, you're now hearing me on this microphone. So I've attenuated the other two microphones. I've pulled their faders back. So you're just hearing this microphone at this point. This is the Earthworks SR314. I would generally keep it, um, I, yeah, Samsung Q2U is a dynamic microphone, I believe. So um, that microphone has a tendency to, a lot of plosives. So if you don't have a foam cover for it, I'd be very careful, I would talk past the grill instead of straight into the grill like that that would be my preference and i would keep it fairly close I, I notice sometimes people that don't work with microphones a lot will have a tendency to bring the microphone down especially if they're shy <laughs> so you need, you need to keep it up relatively close but i would talk just past uh, at, a, at a 45 degree angle to you roughly and don't don't you don't want any bursts of air to go straight into the grill especially on that q2u unless you're using a uh, foam cover. So that's generally, those are some of my general ideas. Also, um, you don't want, if you're being, if it's a live, I don't know if it's a live PA, are you just recording it? Um, or is that microphone also being fed to a live public address system? If it is, you'll have to be, you'll want to be careful about feedback as well, which um, it's a, it's a dynamic microphone, so you shouldn't have a huge issue with that. It's also, it's a dynamic cardioid microphone, so you shouldn't have a huge issue with that, but um, you'll just want to test and make sure that you're not ringing in the room there before you start recording. So there's a there's some thoughts there. Okay, and now we're back on this microphone here. Just set that down, okay. Christopher, the original Dugan algorithm works for music. It was designed for theater Broadway. Then he created gain sharing for spoken voice. Dugan hardware does both. Um, 
Okay, good point. Yeah, so if it's, yeah, for Broadway, I have heard of them used for musicals, for the voices, for the singers. Um, so the idea is that when someone's not singing, it's attenuating their voice. When they are singing, multiple people in particular are singing together, then it will attenuate each of them just a little bit while all the people that are not singing, it'll bring theirs down. Good point. Thanks for the correction, Christopher. For an orchestra, though, I don't really... Hmm. I don't know. You'd have to experiment with that. Diesel says, it's uh, informal speech, if that's the right word. No, that makes sense. Yep. You bet. You bet. Good luck. Ah, great question from Linda. Does the Rodecaster Pro feature auto mix? No, it does not. It features noise gates, um, but it does not have auto mix. I would love to see that on the Rodecaster Pro or on another device like the Rodecaster Pro. Would love to see that. That'd be super useful. So here, here's the thing. Every single one of those pieces of hardware, the, the least expensive one is probably the Zoom F6 that I listed. Does anyone know of a recorder mixer that costs less than the Zoom F6, which, how much does the Zoom F6 cost these days? I'm not even sure. When I bought it, I think it was 650. Um, let's see what it goes for now. Looks like it's about 750 now. So does anyone know of a audio, an audio recorder or mixer that does some sort of auto mix that costs less than $750? I'd love to know about it if you do know of some, such a thing. So, and it would be great if the Rodecaster Pro had it. And that's basically an audio computer. I, I think they might be able to do it. Greg says, uh, hi, Greg. For narrative film, I like to auto mix my booms and plant mics for sending to camera hop. Good. Yeah. No, that can totally make sense and probably make it a lot easier for the camera audio for the editors. Um, having something that's already sort of pre-mixed that way. Good point. So definitely can be used for production sound as well. Uh, my, I will, I will, let me clarify one thing. When we were talking about the three to one rule, obviously in some narrative films, you can't, you don't control that. The blocking is, is defined by the director and the script and the writers. So um, I'm not saying you should not do that. That's why I'm saying in a narrative film like that, when you do have actors working very close to each other, um, typically with the, with both a boom and lav mics, they're going to get, they're going to violate that three to one rule. So that's okay. It's okay. It's not usually live. Alex, can you briefly explain how you assign set frequencies using your sound devices, 888 SL2 to your transmitters? Um, yeah, very briefly, um, we did we talk about that in the we did a stream a few week a uh, few months ago on the eight on the eight eighty eight and the A twenty receiver and demonstrated some things. In short, um, you do a scan on the receiver and identify the frequencies. Also, there's an app for uh, certainly for iOS called Freak Finder F R E Q Finder, um, which is really helpful as well. It will help you to avoid any sort of potential intermodulation issues. So you can tell it how many channels you need, um, give it the first, give, you know, input the frequency that you're planning to use for the first one, and it will tell you where the potential intermodulation could occur and where you should avoid. So um, that that's that's the first. So that, that's how I usually approach it if I'm doing multiple channels. Um, do a scan first, figure out where you want to put your primary frequency, turn that on, get that configured and then go and get your next one so you, you could actually do another scan if you need to but using Finder is a good way to do it how do you spell that again f-r-e-q f-i-n-d-e-r freak finder okay thanks yeah so that's the general idea alex and see that previous live stream for more details i think we i think we demonstrated that to some extent here's a clarification all right, clarification uh, from Diesel, recorded only. Okay, you're not gonna have to worry about feedback then. Unless you're also using a different PA system. <laughs> uh, you're probably gonna be fine. Don't worry about it. Good, okay. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Another question Danny says. I'm gonna take a quick sip of water here. Hmm, this is kind of... 
Loud and clear, yo yo, to my ears, it seems the Sennheiser G4 is at least as solid as the AVX, and now possibly also the new one with the magnetic mount. I'll stick with my G4. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're happy with your G4, stick with your G4. Don't, don't go buying gear just because there's a new version. Um, so the EWDP is the one that we reviewed on our main channel today. It is primarily for feeding audio into cameras. Basically, uh, the way that a lot of people use their G3s and G4s, although G3 and G4 can be used for other use cases beyond that. Um, but this is the new version of Sennheiser's digital system. Um, it does have more dynamic range, so if you're having any issues with your di with dynamic range ever, um, that might be a reason to upgrade. It is simpler to use. I will say that the process of scanning and assigning frequencies is a little bit more straightforward. So... But if you're not having issues with those, yeah, stick with your G4 for sure. Nice glasses, man. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we're also doing the a little test here. Uh, we're getting some reflections. I was just making sure that we're not getting too many reflections. So my key light's up here. I've got the computer screen right there. It's a big, big monitor there. Plus I've got all any uh, lights coming off of the board here. And I'm curious how many reflections we're getting doesn't seem too bad no okay good it's an experiment for for a future project all right what else have we got out in the chat there some nice discussion going on okay are there other questions too uh, aside from auto mixing i guess we had a couple of them there but i put them all in all right well that's it i guess we can all go home it's uh 12 31 our time <laughs> Um, let me just, uh, don't switch to the Mac. Let me just check um, if any late emails came in here. Were we going to do the, was I going to talk over there? Yeah, we'll have you come talk over here again in just a minute. Oh, I, I do have some more things to show actually on the Allen and Heath. So we'll come back to that in just a moment here. Okay, I cannot check that right here right now, so we're going to cancel that. Okay, well, let's go ahead and let me show you the implementation of um, auto mixing here on the Allen & Heath SQ5. So we'll switch to the overhead camera. And when we do that, you can see here we have this interface. This will be tough to see on a phone, so I apologize if you're on a phone. But if you're uh, when you get back to your computer and you have a bigger screen and you can go full screen on this, it'll probably make a little more sense. But what this does is, first of all, we can assign which microphones we want to include in our auto mix. And right now I have, you can see here, um, this is my mic, the first one here. This is Danny's mic. And you can see as I talk, it's, re it's reacting to that. And in fact, let me just go ahead and bring up the fader on that third microphone we have set there. You see that? Um, now it's using this to... And that may be running a little hot in terms of gain, but in any case, and actually it's closer to me. That's part of the reason why it's giving me more. But the blue here essentially represents the vir the virtual fader, the automatic fader that is being applied to each of these as I talk. Now, if I stop and Danny starts talking. Hi, I hope everyone's doing well today. This is Danny from the basement. <laughs> you can see what it did there is it, it attenuated my mic and this other mic and boosted hers. So this is that's that's how this one's working. Now, I don't know exactly the algorithm it's using, but you can see here. So first of all, I can ass assign which ones I want. And I can have up to two different automatic mic mixer banks. And each automatic mic mixer, I believe, can have some ridiculous number of microphones. I think it's 48, 48 channels uh, if you do just one, or I think 24 channels if you do two. But there are some things in its detection algorithm here. So the thing is you can apply uh, a filter here. So essentially what's happening is it's sending a chain, a side chain. So off all of the microphones, all they're all being sent. Uh, it looks like they're all going to different side chains. And it's using those to help detect who's actually talking at any given time. And you can apply a filter here, essentially a high pass and a low pass filter, so that any sort of... Um, 
noise in the room, broadband noise in the room, is less likely to trigger that microphone and trick the auto mixer into thinking, oh, somebody's talking into this microphone, let's boost it. So it, it uses these filters here. So here, for example, we have a high pass filter set to 250 hertz and a low pass at 2.8 kilohertz. That's pretty aggressive. Um, but overall, what that does is it prevents the system from kind of tripping up. And if there's other kind of room noise, thinking that that's somebody trying to talk and then opening their mics. So that's, that's kind of one of the tricks that this one uses or part of its algorithm, if you will, that it uses. And yeah, and then this coming back, this is the over the overview here. So you can add and dynamically remove microphones from the auto mix. So I can take that microphone out and now it's just wide open. And then I can add it back to the, the mix or I can just turn off the automatic mixer all of us, you know, all together just by doing that here. So that's how it works if in this particular case on the SQ5, I've turned it back on now. And again, all three of the mics are active at this time. So that's how the automatic mixer on the Allen and Heath works. And we can actually experiment here. In fact, let me turn off the, um, if I go back here. Okay, I think it's what it's doing is that, that allows me to adjust the faders. You can't see the faders, they're just they're just down there. <laughs> um, but that allows me to kind of uh, use that as part of the overall effect. So for example, if we come back here to the overview, notice this third microphone right here. That's the one that is sitting between Danny and I. I have the fader all the way up, and as I pull the fader back down, obviously it's not overriding that. It's allowing me to, to also essentially be part of the overall mixing process here. And then if I change, we don't have a lot of noise in this room. We have some fans. You can essentially remove that high pass filter or low pass filter, excuse me. And the high pass. And when I do, it's more likely to let those up or boost those a little bit when I stop talking interestingly. So let's go ahead and put those back in. This one, one again was about 250. This one was all the way down here, 2.8. Let's see if that makes a difference. Back to the overview? Not necessarily. That This uh, third mic is really getting aggressive here. And if I come into the channel for that third mic, it might be gained a little high. Pull it back just a touch, come back over here. Okay. It's doing a lot of cutting in and out. Anyway, I don't know if you're hearing that as well. You're hearing the fan cut in and out, yeah. So I think that's what it's doing. It's that fan, which is right above that third microphone that sits between us, that it's probably picking up. And that's why it keeps opening up more aggressively than even Danny's mic does. So. Again, positioning your microphones uh, relative to each other and relative to potential sound sources is important as well. So definitely something to keep in mind there. So I'm going to go ahead and close that one since we don't need that third microphone. I just pulled the fader down again, just down here. And uh, we shouldn't hear that cutting in and out as much now. Interesting. Okay, cool. All right, let's go back to the main camera here and see what else we've got going in the chat. Did we? Did anyone identify a um, an auto mixing device for less than seven hundred and fifty dollars? I'd be very interested in that. Okay, loud and clear says sure. I'll ask another. What are your thoughts in general about Sheps? I have a Mini CMIT and a CMC One. Love them. I think they're fine microphones. I own a CMC6 with the MK41 capsule, so the super cardioid capsule. Use it as a boom microphone. Um, it works beautifully on some voices. I I think the, the philosophy of Sheps generally is to produce 
a sound that is as neutral as possible. Um, I find that it makes a lot of voices. My particular copy, at least, sounds pretty harsh on a lot of voices. So I don't use it a whole lot. Um, I think it's fine. I think if you if you like it, if you're happy with the results, by all means do it. I think it is what it, what it captures and um, what can be recorded with them is always, uh, you can always EQ it. it. It captures very nicely overall uh, from the standpoint that it, you can definitely tune it in post. What I would say, what I'm saying, I guess, is it didn't sound amazing right out of the recorder. <laughs> it always sounded great if you did some EQ to it, though. So it's one of those kind of microphones. I, I honestly feel like the Neumann U87 is like that on a lot of voices as well. It's like not that great directly into the microphone, but with a little bit of EQ, it usually sounds fantastic. So I think the Sheps kind of falls into that same category. That's my experience. Time for another sip of water. Very dry down here. What have we got going over there, Danny? What's up? Okay. Danny says to read this next one first. Okay. Dan uh, Daniela says, a, a few days ago, Daria from Black Magic did, after six years made it on her channel, an instructional video. Sound was horrible because she used a Yeti microphone. LOL. <laughs> the Yeti can actually, the Yeti gets a bad rap. It's a USB microphone. It's very popular. Um, Blue did amaz an amazing job marketing it and it got, it caught on and lots and lots of people bought it, bought it. But um, I did suggest her to review your channel as the best. Thank you so much, Danielle. She was very happy. Um, thank you. <laughs> yeah, the Yeti is not my first choice, um, even amongst Blue, um, sorry, USB microphones. So but um, I think a lot of people misunderstand how to use it as well. So a lot of times they'll buy it and they'll place it a meter away. and Or they'll talk into the top of it when it's actually a side address microphone or things like that. But yeah, <laughs> it is simple to use. All right, Christopher says, Alan and Heath Dante cards are finally shipping again. Oh, that's great to know. I've had, I had my eyes on those for a long time. Good to know, Christopher. New version 3 implementation now with components they can actually get. After 18 months, I finally have them for my SQ5 and AHM32. Very good. That's good to know they're shipping again. I just actually, I looked last night and it looked like um, the estimated shipping date from BH was sometime in June. So that's great to hear. That's the trick is um, manufacturing in the modern world. If you source parts from places, like China, um, they, you may or may not be able to get them. Alan and Heath uses their own implementation of gain sharing since Dugan patent has expired. Ah, okay, so they're essentially gain sharing as well. Good to know. And I didn't know that the Dugan patent had expired. Um, interesting. All right, Fachiri says, I've been working a reality shoot and I've been using G4s with Rode Go 2s alongside Lectros. I just wanted to hear your thoughts and thank you for all the information I've learned from you. Uh, I think if you're getting great sound, then that's a fantastic combination. Keep keep doing what you're doing. Um, I have done something similar to that before. I was working on a reality show um, years ago. You remember a show called American Chopper? Some of you may have seen it. <laughs> I got a chance to work on a more recent episode. They were kind of trying to reboot the series. I don't know if it ended up getting off the ground or not, but um, I did do... Uh, a one day kind of remote piece for that show and we ran out of channels i had i think how many channels i had four channels of audio limited going and then they had another person they wanted in a particular scene and so i had a, an old road link that i actually used and it worked fine in the end uh, a funny funny thing is that they had to i had to wire everybody up and then we filmed at one spot and then they all had to hop in the cars and then do some more filming. And when, when everybody got out of the car at the second location, the guy that was wearing the road link came up to me and said, I'm so sorry, something happened to your to your wireless microphone thing. <laughs> he had hopped in the car. He had it on his, the back of his belt. Um, and it had just, I think it, something happened. It got mashed and 
that was just an example of how those kind of things don't stand up very well. You know, plastic bodied devices don't stand up so well under regular the regu regular rigors of production sound. So um, we got we got fine sound and we got everything working and and going fine in the end. But um, I'm down one road link re uh, transmitter <laughs> after that. So yeah, if, if, if you're getting the results you want, then it's good. That's, that's my philosophy. Uh, that's clever to filter the trigger by frequency indeed. Um, and I think a lot of them probably have something like that as well. They may, may not tell you about it. It might be more behind the scenes black box, but I think most of them are probably doing some filtering is my guess. All right. Yeti sound fantastic in close proximity behind shield in a dead quiet room on a Tuesday in June or July, I would add. <laughs> That's the thing is that, that the reason that the sound that most people get with the Yeti is bad is because of the way they're using them, not so much because of the microphone itself. So yeah, are they, is it the most amazing set of converters in there? Probably not, but is it, is it good enough if they actually created a good acoustical environment and used the microphone in close proximity and used the pop shield. Yeah, I think you could get pretty good sound with those. All right, we have a note here from Martin. Hey, Curtis, any recommendations for a stereo mic for capturing onset atmosphere under $1,000? Hmm. I don't, I don't have one, not because I don't, just because I don't have a, a stereo microphone for under $1,000 and I don't do a lot of ambient stereo recording. So if anybody here in the community has a recommendation for Martin, please leave that in the chat or in the comments below. would love to hear from you on that. I was going to say, I, there's a, um, I think Audio-Technica has one that's quite popular that a lot of people use, but I don't know what its price is. Let me look it up here quickly. Um, Audio Technica stereo microphone. Is it the eighty twenty two? I'm not positive. I think it might be the BP forty twenty five is the one that I've heard of. So yeah, it's less than a thousand dollars. You might check in with someone who's used that before. I've heard of a number of low um production sound mixers and others, location sound mixers who have used, I think it's this one, the BP4025. So it might be worth a look. And it's less than $1,000. And it looks like they have a small diaphragm one for $400. Um, Jazz says there is the Rode Stereo Video Mic Pro. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's what you intended, but it, if you're doing it on set, I would assume that you're probably recording into a recorder instead of a camera. So... There's also the Rode Stereo X model. This Stereo X model does have an XLR output, as I understand it. So that one would be something worth considering as well. Never used it. I don't, I don't have any personal experience with it. Okay, I'm working on something extremely similar to American Chopper, actually. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, we, we weren't doing anything in the shop for that show on the day that I was working on it. We were just doing walk and talk interviews. So... Um, at one point, five people walking and talking at the same time, which is a, an interesting challenge. But um, yeah, something, I think the BP4025, I don't know if you're planning on planting it or booming it or what, but there are a couple options there. The 8022 and the 4025, I would look at. And I hope the show goes well for you. All right. Semi Lumi, uh, Behringer XR, XR12, and XR18 iPad controlled mixer, mixers feature auto mix for 399 euros and 598 euros prices in Europe from Tomon. Very good. There are some options right there. Behringer. You can usually count on Behringer to hit price points. Um, <laughs> really good price points. Not always the most reliable, but. Uh, Mark, did anyone see the Kentucky Derby and notice the wireless mics in use by NBC Sports, wondering what they are? I haven't looked at any of the video footage, so I haven't seen them. I'll take a look, though. 
Um, they're pro most likely, my guess is that they're electrosonics plug-on transmitters, but I don't know for sure. I'll take a look and see what I can find out. Matt. Okay. I just started laughing. Curtis is talking about room treatment and the Yeti in the same line. That's like Lucas or Ron Howard using a sound engineer that uses DJI or Rode Wireless. I'm just saying, I, what, I, what I'm trying to do, Matt, is fair. What I'm saying is this, is that for people on a tight budget, if they can find a space that sounds a little bit better in their house, or it doesn't even have to be sound blankets, any sort of blankets off camera to mellow out the room, that can make a difference. Get the microphone positioned closer. They can make some decent sound. Now, if you're working on a professional production, you need to invest in the right tools. Um, because uh, I don't think I... A lot of the less expensive electronics of any sort, in my expense, and this is why my comment just a moment ago about Behringer, is that Behringer makes some good products. But they also optimize them for cost, for the price. And so in the manufacturing, they're, they're taking shortcuts that, that you wouldn't normally take when you're producing something for professional use. That's, that's all I'm saying. So if getting the recording is critical, then you probably should pay the money to have a device that's more likely to be reliable and get what you need. So those are some thoughts. And you're right, it is a little bit funny, <laughs> Matt. <laughs> uh, Linda asked, have you ever used the Neumann RSM-190? I have not. In fact, I'm not even sure what the RSM-190 is, but let's take a look. I mean, I'll just do a Google for just Google search for that, or a, actually a DuckDuckGo search, technically. Neumann RSM-190. Oh, it's a stereo shotgun microphone, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, okay, here it is. A stereo shotgun microphone. Uh, oh, it was. It's no longer in production, It would I would assume. Um, in any case, it was a mid-side microphone with the shotgun part delivering the mid-component and a second figure eight capsule system angled 90 degrees, providing the S component. Excuse me, the S component. Um, so yeah, I have not used that particular one. Oops, looks like um, need to get rid of that. Uh, I've used Senkin. Senkin has a version of that that I have used um, many, many years ago. I did a review of that one. I was a little bit in over my head, to be honest. I'm not. I'm not 100 sure that that might be the kind of thing that if you want to do a, an interview with naturalistic sound, something like this could be useful because then you're getting, when you intentionally want to get the ambiance, um, you can do that and also directionally get the, um, the, the dialogue that you're trying to capture as well. But that's a, it's an interesting concept, very niche. Um, not a lot of people need that, but pretty interesting nonetheless. Zach. Any thoughts or information on DVE closing down? No, I hadn't heard that, Zach. I'm doing just a little, a quick search here. Oh no, this is heavy heart. We must inform you that DVE store has officially closed after 18 years of service. Due to unforeseen circumstances in the changing market landscape, we've made the difficult decision to close our doors. We understand this news may be disappointing, but we want to ensure you this decision will not be made lightly. Extend our deepest gratitude to all of our customers, employees, and partners who have supported us through the years. Thank you for being a part of our journey, and we wish you all the best. Well, that's the end of an era. That's too bad, because they were one of the, the few kind of more independent stores out there for video equipment in general. And um, I'm, I'm actually sad. I guess that's it, Zach. I'm sad. I actually ordered quite a bit of equipment from them. <laughs> what? <laughs> Danny, your laugh is coming through the auto mix. Um, I know. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not laughing that they're closing. I, I, that is sad because that would be like, for me, a music shop that I had bought a lot of gear from or a bookstore that I enjoyed or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, that's sad. Yeah. 
only the admission on air that you had uh, done your part to support them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I like DVE store. A little too, I guess is a little too, a little too little, a little too late for me in terms of endorsing them, I guess. But I, we've actually had multiple affiliate links for them over the years as well. So anyway, I wish all of the folks that, that ran that uh, the best. All right. Not particularly relevant to anything at the moment, but what segment of the market do you think the Deity Theo system is aiming for? The system sounds pretty interesting. Yes. <clears throat> I would love to talk about that. And let me say this, first of all, this is a product that's been announced, but has not shipped. So we have to keep that in mind. And I've actually, I was a little, um, I'm interested. Uh, so we released the video on the EWDP this morning. That's Sennheiser's new wireless microphone system. Single channel receiver um, that sits on top of your camera, feeds audio into your camera. Um, digital version, essentially, of kind of the next, the next step uh, beyond the G4 system. So it's a UHF. You can choose the frequency that you, that you transmit on, which you cannot do with the AVX, um, but it's also digital, which the G4 and the G3 were not. Um, on that, some people have left comments like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, Didi is going to eat their lunch with the Theos. And I'm like, well, so first of all, I think that's the mark, the part of the market that they're aiming for is kind of prosumers. Because that, from my point of view, that's exactly what the EWDP is aimed at, is prosumers. Someone that um, maybe, you know, maybe making a documentary film, for example, on a tight budget, that kind of situation, maybe for news gathering. Um, but Theos hasn't shipped yet. And while they announced a whole bunch of features, and I hope they ship it with all of those features at a reasonable price, we don't know if they're going to be able to do that or not. And for example... Recording on a body pack transmitter that has a lavalier connected to it, that's protected by U.S. patents still held by Zaxcom. So either they're going to have to license that technology from Zaxcom, which they might do. They did that actually with one of their previous, with their BPTRX, I believe. Um, but that adds to the price, so that's going to potentially move the price up a little bit. And it also depends on how well it's implemented. And so there are a lot of things going on there. I think Theos is really interesting. The set of features it has is amazing. It's it's basically a lot of the features you would see on the, the high-end pro gear, um, but it will probably be a lot less expensive. The thing is, is that we just don't know yet. <laughs> and I think it's it's a little bit... I don't think we're in a position yet, any of us are in a position yet, to say that the Sennheiser DW, EWDP, for example, is a piece of junk and nobody should ever buy it. Because we don't know, you know, if you're saying that in the context of comparing it to the DD Theos, the DD Theos is not shipping. It's not being manufactured yet. Nobody's used it yet, aside for testing in at, at Deity internally. So nobody knows. Um, another person, the, the person that left that comment also said, and you only get 25 meters of range outdoors. You have to spend a lot more money to get a, a better range than that. Like uh, basically, in that same test that I do outdoors, out wide open outdoors, no walls nearby, all of the consumer systems don't go farther than that as well. If you have it on your back, you know, mount the the transmitter on the back of your belt. If it's direct direct line of sight, you can get a lot farther than that. Um, but that's just the nature of wireless. That's physics. So. Um, I think that it's a little bit premature for people to say that the Sennheiser system is doomed because Deity Theos already has it beat. Because in my mind, Deity Theos is still vaporware. And, and I hope it comes to market and I hope it ships with everything that they say it's going to ship with. But we don't know yet. So I would just be careful about that. And I love Deity products, by the way. Don't anyone misunderstand this. I have, I have their smart slate. I actually think the smart slate and the time cut system are both pretty good. Uh, loud and clear. Bandrew Scott does plenty of content using cheapo mics, and they sound good because he knows what he's doing. Indeed, that's the point of those demonstrations. Indeed, I agree. If you use the right technique, you can make most microphones that are produced in 2023 sound pretty good. Um, Matt Ruff says, best place to sell used equipment. I don't know. I think you're referring to DVE store, perhaps. Um, but yeah, that was... Yes. Moment of silence for DVE store. Okay, from the logician. 
Danny, do you look at Curtis a bit funny each time a new piece of tech shows up at the door? The same look that my wife gives me? Okay, I'm going to be quiet while Danny answers this question. I put it, I put it up. Uh, can you expand on that a little bit? No, not at this time. <laughs> um, earlier in my career, definitely, I think it created a lot more stress for Danny. Now, we don't purchase any of these things out of our personal budget. These purchases are all made um, by the business. And what's more is that uh, we're pretty intentional about what we buy now, um, especially in the last year or so, I would say. We're like, I have, we have so much gear here. We don't need... I don't need another consumer wireless system, I promise you. And the fact that Rode gives me a consumer wireless system to review, happy to do it for everybody out there that's considering buying it. But for me, we don't need it. <laughs> we really don't. So it's not a it's not a gear envy kind of thing or a gear acquisition syndrome thing at this point for us now. It's, it's very much a business and we're just doing what we need to do to service the customers in a, in a really professional quality way. So... All right, do we have time for one last one? Matt says, there is definitely a lack of mid-priced LAV systems. My DJI costs $300, my Shure system costs $8,000. So I'm sure, I imagine you're talking about the Axiant Digital. Um, there is, I think the, the main players there are Sennheiser in this mid-marketplace, this prosumer realm. The main players are Sennheiser, Sony, Basically, Sennheiser and Sony, from from what I know, from from those that I'm familiar with. When you get down to DJI and um, Rode and all of those, the 2.4 gigahertz system, I consider all those consumer level systems. They're fine. They do the job if they fit your particular workflow and what you're trying to achieve. Um, but yeah, there is definitely kind of a hole in that mid range market. I would say mid range kind of UHF system. So I think Deity is is hitting the exact right market right in the middle. And I wish them all the best in doing that. All right. I believe we are just about at time. Anything else we need to cover before we wrap here, Danny? All good? Okay. All right, everybody. It's time. Get out there. Go make some great sound. And we will talk to you again next week. Take care. <laughs>